this computer. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in our webinar today with Dr. Lori Powell. Um, we are so excited to be doing this. Well, Lori will be talking about the project that was staffed TBI Skill Builder today. Um, and I know so many of you have been giving us wonderful feedback already and sending us questions ahead of time. So we're so happy to have you here and participating. Um, just a couple of notes as we're getting into this. Um, I will be monitoring chat and I'm, I should introduce myself. I'm Amanda Perez and I am with the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. Um, so I am going to be the moderator who's in the background as a support to Lori. Um, and so as you have questions, I'll be helping out with those. You'll see, and I see many of you are already using the chat function. If you've got questions, any technical kinds of things, please throw those my way. I'll do my best to help you. Um, but I'd also strongly encourage you that as you have questions as Lori's talking, please put them in there because I know people tend to forget what their questions are as we're going along and we'll do our best to fit those in um, so that Lori will have a chance to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so with all of that said, Lori, I'm going to turn this over to you and let um, you get started. All right. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, thanks to all of you here today on this webinar in which I'll provide an overview of the staff TBI Skill Builder Program for frontline staff serving adults with brain injury. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging our funder, the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, they provided the funding for this three-year development grant. So thank you, Nidler. A little bit about who we are at the Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. We are an institute within the Department of Psychology uh, within the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon in Eugene. And our work focuses on research, training, and advocacy related projects for children and adults with brain injury, their families, and the providers who serve them. So today we're gonna to focus on the training and the provider piece of that work. And our learning objectives are twofold. Um, first of all, hoping that you come away with um, an appreciation for the importance of training both knowledge and skills uh, for staff frontline staff serving this population, and also to provide you with a range of information and training resources besides uh, the Skill Builder Program to support you in developing your toolkit of training options uh, for staff. And here's a bit of an outline for today's uh, talk. We'll begin with some background uh, information about how we came about putting the program together, uh, the reason for that, and then talk a little bit about how we developed the program. Uh, and then finally give you uh, an overview of the program and some sample content. Uh, then we'll take a look at our product evaluation results in which we evaluated the Skill Builder program among providers um, serving adults with brain injuries. And then finally, how to access the program and where we are currently with it, with hopefully a little bit of time left over to address some, some, some of your questions. So please use the chat function and uh, um, we'll do what we can to address some of your comments and questions. Okay, so let's begin with a bit of background information about uh, how it all came about. And I will begin by acknowledging, uh, first of all, uh, a, a big part of what we've done at Siebert for quite some time is develop other types of online training program, uh, programs for both family members and for uh, educators serving students, children, and then students in the schools uh, who are, are living with brain injuries. And one such example of that is the In the Classroom program, perhaps some of you are familiar with In the Classroom, um, developed by Drs. Ann Glang and Melissa McCart at Siebert, Center on Brain Injury Research and Training. Um, in the Classroom is free now to educators and it is comprised of a multimodal framework which we used for skill builder. So in the classroom is comprised of evidence-based instructional strategies stretched across nine modules. Um, there are brief interviews with educators as well as skills videos involving uh, professional actors that uh, illustrate very specific skills that are good for educators to know. Uh, there's, there's several supplemental resources if you want to find out more information, and it was evaluated in a, uh, a multi-state randomized control trial. So 
in the classroom. It was very exciting to see it put together and it inspired me to um, pursue a similar kind of program for frontline staff serving adults. So when we talk about frontline staff, who, who exactly are we um, talking about here? And really it's a very broad term to include a range of roles, um, including direct care staff, personal care attendants, certified nursing assistants onto job coaches, day program staff, resource facilitators, and so many other roles. But the common thing, um, theme among these roles is that um, they have very regular direct day-to-day -day often contact with adults with brain injuries. And these staff play a crucial role in supporting uh, people with brain injury, often having more contact time than medical and rehabilitation professionals, and yet may not have the access to the training they need to serve this population. So here is a, a quote that came out of a survey that we conducted in the first year of the Skill Builder uh, project. And, and I'd like to read it to you because it really sets the stage for, for the work ahead. This staff person said, I love my job, but I was certainly not trained or offered training that adequately prepared me. I felt like I was put in a sink or swim position. I fortunately learned to swim, but only because of my own initiative. So one source of many uh, to inspiring this work and this program. And let's take a, another uh, um, uh, view on why frontline staff training is important. And we're gonna use the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning and Disability and Health to help us with that framework. This model is, is, is often considered a biopsychosocial model of addressing disability, all kinds of disabilities. So it's a very holistic model of thinking about disability. So applied to the world of brain injury, if you look at that middle gray square up at the top, the health condition in this case would be brain injury. And then if you look at the square on the left-hand side, body functions and structures, that refers to the, the impacts of both you know, changes in physical functioning, cognitive functioning, emotional functioning, and so forth as a result of the brain injury. And then on the right-hand side, we are looking at, well, how are those changes in functions and structures impacting a person's activities of daily living and their ability to participate in personally, personally meaningful roles in, in, in their daily lives? So those are three interconnected squares, but right there in the middle and at the bottom is the blue square, the environmental and the personal factors, the physical, social, attitudinal, and environmental factors that include the people surrounding the person with the brain injury, family members, friends, and staff. So they can exert a tremendous impact. Um, a highly trained, knowledgeable, caring, skilled staff person can have a tremendously positive impact on the life of a person with a brain injury. So that is also what drove us to develop this program. So speaking of development, let's hop right into that topic. So as I mentioned earlier, we conducted a, an online nationwide survey in the first year of the Skill Builder Project in which we surveyed frontline staff, professionals who supervise frontline staff, adults with brain injury, and their family members. Um, all of those different versions of the survey, but all converging on the topic of what do frontline staff need? What is their experience uh, uh, with serving this population? What are their training needs and so forth? And then we took that information and then brought it together with our advisory board members comprised of these same stakeholder groups. We had frontline staff on our council, we had adults with brain injury, we had rehabilitation professionals, family members, and so forth. We also had expert consultants to help us with very particular aspects of the program, and culture, including a cultural sensitivity review of our materials. And then we also had the interviewees that you'll see a little bit later in the program to help really inform and shape the content. Once the program was put together and iterated several times, uh, uh, uploaded it into our online framework, we conducted a pilot study, fine-tuned the program, and then put it through a nationwide product evaluation and some single case testing. So altogether, we had well over 240 uh, vital sources of input to help shape 
skill builder. And so what did the stakeholders want? And here's just a few key themes. Uh, first of all, they wanted the program to focus on staff who were new to working with this population, um, to really think about providing a foundation uh, of essential information and skills from which a staff person can grow and advance. The, also, the, uh, the next core theme was that it'd be person-centered, uh, person-centered from the perspective of the person with the brain injury, but also person-centered for the staff themselves to think about how they're doing, staff self-care. We do have a module addressing that topic. Um, and we also were advised, keep it brief. Um, each module, especially, needs to be very brief, very tight, uh, 14 modules total. It takes about three hours, more or less, to get through the entire program. Uh, and this is because if staff are being asked to do this training on their work time, they may not have long stretches of time to get through a, a course. So if you can break it up into little packets, that can be very helpful. Uh, of course, online is helpful. This is uh, asynchronous online training. So that means it's accessible anytime. Staff do not have to come together at a particular time, uh, kind of like what we're doing today. Um, that it should complement other types of training and does not replace in-person training. These are really uh, key pieces. Skill Builder is a tool and an ever-growing toolkit of options for training, but there's just no way you can replace the, the lived support and uh, that you get from a supervisor giving you feedback, um, uh, other peers that you're working with, and most importantly, um, persons with brain injury themselves giving staff feedback on how it's going. So it's just part of a larger uh, grouping of resources that we're gonna talk about right now, as a matter of fact. So I'd like to call out some really key examples. This is not exhaustive, but really would like you all to know about, for starting with the Brain Injury Association of America's Fundamentals course, designed for frontline staff and family members. It's a small group um, style of training uh, that covers similar types of material, but also goes into greater depth, let's say, with medication management, for example. So that's an excellent course you can take a look at. We also have the Ohio Valley Center for Brain Injury Prevention and Rehab, accommodating the symptoms of traumatic brain injury, um, and uh, a link to their materials, including the workbook and some key videos. Uh, we have the National Association of State Head Injury Administrators, uh, they're providing an ever-growing list of resources for professional training. Moving on to the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices. This is for all persons with disabilities, but there are an ever-growing list of materials specific to person-centered practices for people with brain injuries. We have BrainLine, great resource if you haven't had a chance to look at it. it, it there's sections for caregivers, survivors, staff, um, excellent, excellent work that they've done as well. TBI model systems, knowledge translation center, worksheets and video clips and then the Rehab Hospital of Indiana fact sheets. All of these together, uh, we've linked to several of these programs within Skill Builder. They're just excellent resources that hit different aspects of training, and we just want to push those out to all of you. Okay, so let's come back to Skill Builder for a moment and talk about the design principles that went into the program. So similar to in the classroom, we wanted to use multiple formats to help um, staff with different learning styles. So we use text, videos, interactive exercises, quizzes, and there's a skills journal as a component as well. And we, uh, we wanted to focus on essential knowledge and skills, um, and, but avoid information overload. So it's, it's not an easy thing to think about what do you include, what do you omit? In, in working in this, this space, there's just so much to learn. But if we're really trying to focus on skill acquisition for staff, it's really important to really constrain the amount of content and really home in on it and practice it to support staff learning retention and at practical application in, in, in their daily work. In terms of staff skill selection, um, we went with very common sense, commonly used skills. You're gonna see a lot of the skills uh, uh, taught in the program elsewhere. Uh, and that's a good thing because um, these are applicable across different persons and situations. So for example, uh, in module four, support communication part two, where we talk more about um, uh, 
spoken communication and in, in the moment of an interaction. Um, there's the adjust spoken input skill for staff. And then there's the adjust non spoken input. So what I mean by spoken input is are the words that you say, the questions you ask, the statements you make. And let's say in the case of a question for some people with brain injury, if staff ask a more open ended question, that would be an appropriate choice. So, uh, you know, who is your favorite baseball team is a WH open ended question. Uh, allowing the person to kind of bring up their response. Um, whereas with somebody else or in another situation, you might ask a question that could be answered with a yes or no. Do you like the Dodgers? Yes or no. Um, the main thing here, there's no right or wrong. It's as a staff, I know I can adjust my spoken input to meet the needs of this person. Uh, I can adjust my questions. I can adjust my comments. And similarly with non-spoken input, here we're talking about, in other words, nonverbal input facial expressions, gestures, tone of voice. It's not what you say, but how you say it. In fact, in this regard, we had a, a, a participant in our product evaluation study who commented in her skills journal um, that a client had given her feedback that her gestures, facial expressions, and so forth were uh, uh, over the top in a sense, more animated than the person with brain injury could really take in and process. Um, and so it was just a lovely, uh, realization for this staff person to say, oh, I need to dial it back a little bit. This is overstimulating <laughs> for this person. Whereas with someone else, with another, uh, another person with brain injury might need that extra nonverbal, non-spoken input to really bring home the, the message. So again, keywords, adjust, adapt, and then know what it is you're adjusting, adapting, in this case, spoken or non-spoken input. So that's just one of many examples um, in the program like that. So the however part of this is that these are not, the skills taught in the program are not the only skills staff will need and not all the skills taught are gonna be relevant for all persons with brain injury. And so what I mean by that is, for example, we have a, a, a skill called um, support uh, or pro problem solve together. And problem solving is a very high level executive function skill. Uh, it takes awareness that there's a problem. It, makes, uh, it requires the ability to describe the problem, generate solutions, look at the pros and cons of the solutions. And so for some individuals with brain injury, they, with support from staff, might be able to work through like the worksheet we offer in that part of the training. And to talk it through, it's a conversation starter. But maybe for someone else, it's just, you just can't go there. It's just maybe awareness of issues may not be in a place where that would be an effective skill to do. So that's an example where it may not be appropriate for some, but maybe for others. In terms of how we went about designing the videos, because these are crucial components to this program, um, program the personal story videos uh, of the lived experience of in the case of a person living with brain injury, we have two survivors of brain injury who are interviewed for the program. We have two family members and we have two frontline staff. And these videos are, are absolutely crucial and central to the program. In my view, they are the heartbeat uh, of Skill Builder because um, everything else is sort of keyed off what it is like to be in that space. Um, and then the skills videos involve professional actors. Uh, and this is a very intentional choice to use actors um, because we wanna really, um, we have to script out the contrast we want to convey in order to make the point about a particular skill. And so the, and these skills, these uh, contrasts need to be very clear. Our past research has shown that if you try to make the differences between a positive and negative version of trying to implement a skill, uh, sometimes it doesn't always register. So we've had to emphasize uh, making these contrasts very clear sometimes a little over the top, but they make the point. Uh, and so therefore they may not always be realistic, but again, it's a different priority. So if you, if you put together the personal story videos, which are tapping into real life, in the skills videos, you have a nice package. And then note that all the videos in the program are closed captioned in English and Spanish. Um, so now today, a little bit later, I'll start showing you some of those videos. Unfortunately, I don't have the closed captioned versions in this PowerPoint. They're only available in the YouTube clips that are embedded within the program. So let's take a look at some sample content, overview of the program and some sample content. So 
The 14 modules are split up into two categories. Modules one through six are the basic skills categories. What are important facts about brain injury? How do I go about getting to know a person with brain injury? How can I support them in their communication? And there's two parts to that uh, work. It's so important. Uh, also supporting the use of memory tools. Uh, and by that, I mean low tech and high tech um, tools, low tech meaning calendars, wall calendars, timers, sticky notes, high tech tools could be a smartphone app uh, and other kinds of uh, more advanced technologies. Uh, and then supporting cognition. So there's a whole other range of wonderful strategies staff can use to support uh, an individual's cognition in, in, in getting through the day. And then our advanced skills um, start with supporting access to healthcare providers' activities of daily living and wellness routines. So you'll notice a big jump between the basic skills that are a little more granular and then these advanced skills, which depend on and integrate the basic skills taught earlier. Uh, and this module seven uh, is a crucial one to think about. Uh, we had a program manager on our advisory council who said, please, if you don't do anything else, please emphasize in this program um, the, the importance of supporting a person with a brain injury as they navigate their healthcare needs. Um, because if you're struggling with memory and attention and organizational skills, um, it's gonna be really hard to track when are my appointments? When am I learning from my providers? Uh, and then taking that information home and remembering to act on it. So we made sure that that was emphasized uh, at the top of the advanced skills list, but then right behind it, you could consider this like two sides of the same coin, support participation in personally meaningful activities. Um, in, in, when I used to work at an outpatient clinic for adults with, with brain injury, it was just so, um, as I'm a speech pathologist by training, by the way, and specialized in cognitive rehabilitation. And in this clinic, uh, so many of the clients would come in and say, I'm just so tired of all these appointments <laughs> and um, I wish I could get my life back. I wish I could get my, the joy back in my life, but there's no time for that. Um, I think this is a common theme. And so to the extent that staff can recognize that in addition to all the have to's, Let's support the want to's and the goals that really uh, energize a person in their daily life. So we emphasize those two. And then on down the list, building positive daily routines for both the healthcare, wellness, and personally meaningful activities, taking a breath and talking about self care for staff. And then we talk about challenging behaviors, both getting some background thinking about challenging behaviors across the domains of, of, um, cognition, emotions, uh, uh, physical needs, and so forth, and then responding to them in the moment. And the reason why we put this section further down the list is to the extent that staff can feel more comfortable with some of those basic skills, that maybe that will help um, reduce somewhat some of the challenging behaviors. It doesn't always work, but it really is kind of the thinking. Let's get person-centered up front, positive behavior supports, and then we definitely still want to focus on these needs as well. And then we round out with understanding conditions that co-occur with brain injury, and we're focusing here on behavioral health, the substance use disorder and, and mental health issues. And then finally, practice putting it all together. Each of the module sections include important to know information, skills for success, and then the personal stories videos, the skills videos, want to learn more. So if you maybe are not necessarily new to brain injury, and this is a nice refresher course, you can go off and learn some more information. The quizzes are meant to help integrate and activate the information learned and then the skills journal. Here are some samples, uh, skills from the skills checklist that you download once you register from the program. You can kind of take a look at that. We've talked about some of those already. Um, support use of memory tools, support cognition. And again, I want to emphasize that these are skills for staff to support the person, uh, but there is some carryover to where you can teach some of these skills to the individual themselves. You know, it just depends. Uh, but this is mainly for staff to think ahead, plan ahead, for example. This is for staff to think about, build an extra time for appointments or grocery shopping or whatever, so we're not rushed and can be more focused and so forth, having a backup plan. Um, 
Okay, this is what the landing page looks like. So it helps orient you to the program and gives you some guidance on maybe not going through all the modules all at once, but maybe a few at a time to give you a chance to absorb uh, and apply the information. Okay, let's take a peek into module one, some sample content and a few of the video clips. And uh, before I forget, I just wanna say, uh, with the video clips, they're fairly brief, but you're going to notice a little bit of a disconnect between what you hear and the timing with watching um, the lips of the person speaking. This is a, just an artifact of transmitting video information through the video format of Zoom conference calling. So thanks for your patience with that. So here's a, the landing page for module one. Each of the modules has a little introductory paragraph. And then here in module one, we start with what are the causes of brain injury. We have a diagram with, to kind of orient staff to the different functions that are located in different parts of the brain and so forth. And then we talk quite a bit about brain injury impacts across these domains of cognition, communication, physical, uh, changes, medical conditions, behaviors, and emotions. So we keep coming back to these themes throughout the modules. All right, so let's listen to Brian, who is um, a survivor of brain injury. For the staff, I would say an important thing to remember is that it's very difficult to be the individual with the brain injury. So um, I think we could all agree that's a, a very profound and foundational way to, to begin the program, having that back of mind if I'm a staff person. Let's move on to Jill, who is a frontline staff. I had an idea uh, of what brain injury was, and then upon working here, I realized I was, I was so wrong. Um, because that's, that's when I learned that just like no two people are alike, no two brain injuries are alike. That's why I believe that it's important to create a person centered program, um, person centered care specific to their needs and wants their desires. All right. And now let's listen to Maria, a family member. My son is uh, 28 years old now, and he was 16 when he had his traumatic uh, brain injury due to a car crash. He was hospitalized a month. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, it was pretty challenging. It felt that I had a different person in my house. Um, but yet it was him, seeing him, it was him. All right. All right, let's go ahead and move on to module two, getting to know the person. Again, some sample content and video clips. So here's a section from that module. As a staff, how can I find out about their background, interests, and personalities? And a little bit of a disclaimer here, the little dog that you see in that photograph happens to be one of our two dogs, uh, Pirate. So we brought him on set for <laughs> the video shoot. Um, so how can I find out about the person's interest and personality? Maybe they've had a, uh, some pets uh, that they wanna talk about. They have a whole history to really, really explore very broadly, preferred language, cultural backgrounds, health beliefs, and so forth, what is the role of the family. Um, and there's some caveats interlaced in the modules, like these can be sensitive topics, so consider how and when to discuss. There's no right or wrong here. There's a, just being aware of how to approach in a way that makes sense for each individual. So let's hear from Derek, a frontline staff. I think it's important working with someone that has a traumatic brain injury that we focus on not simply understanding the injury, but the whole person. Um, oftentimes people that have traumatic brain injuries are dismissed. Their reactions, their behaviors, their life experiences are dismissed simply because they have a traumatic brain injury. And now let's hear from Jill, also frontline staff. A quote that I've always lived by is, to seek to understand before you're understood. As you learn to understand the whole picture 
and understand their wants and their needs, the ability to create a specific plan, uh, the success in that plan increases proportionately. All right. Um, you hear uh, quite a bit through uh, Dylan, um, the person before Jill, and Jill herself, the person-centered aspect is, is crucial um, in, in their work. So let's move on from these personal story videos to now a, a, a compare contrast skills video in this space of getting to know a person. Let's watch this first example. Hi, Rachel. Wow, beautiful picture. Uh -huh. You're doing a really great job. I'll see you tomorrow morning for your meds. Uh -huh. Okay, let's contrast that example with the next one. Hi, Rachel. Wow, beautiful picture. Okay, if I join you? Yeah. Find the corners. One thing I'm still good at. Ever since the accident, I just can't, you know, think straight. But this helps. What else changed for you? Just about everything. All right, so if you think about those two examples, in the first one, um, there was nothing inherently wrong with it, right? This was a very kind staff. She showed interest in what Rachel was doing, um, checking in about meds tomorrow. Um, so it, it all was, was very fine. But with the second one, you see the obvious difference where the staff person is trying to create a little extra time and space to sit down and get to know the person a little better. Um, and maybe you picked up on the fact that she didn't start talking right away. She just sat there and worked the puzzle with Rachel and then let just things happen um, and to see if maybe she would open up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if I'm a staff working in a, a very busy environment with lots of clients and lots of demands on my time, I may or may not have the kind of time to sit down and do one-to-ones like that. And that is totally fine. I think really what we want to drive home here is the idea, the principle of taking time to get to know a person in whatever way you can do that given the constraints of your position. So maybe if we were to redo this uh, sample, maybe we would just have the staff say, well, hey, I've got a couple minutes. Do you mind if I put in a few pieces to help you out? So you sit down, do it, and say, okay, I'll catch you later. Maybe there's no um, space for more in-depth conversation, and that's okay. But the, the goal here is just doing something to help get to know the person on a person-centered level. Um, there's whole sorts of ways to do this. Watching a baseball game together. I seem to be focusing on baseball quite a bit. Uh, favorite sport. Um, uh, pets, I mean, you name it. The, the range is, is limitless, but the goal is the same. Just taking some time and learning. Talking to family members is an awesome way to do this as well. Okay, module three, support communication, part one. This is the landing page for that module. Uh, skills for success, adjust your topic, timing, attention before you maybe move into a, 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 um, a conversation. And then this way that it's set up skill on the left side and the how on the right. This is, we've tried to make it a really clear and clean distinction uh, so you can get the core idea and then how to implement it. And then in this um, screenshot, you're seeing uh, on the left, the quiz me, uh, an example of an engagement exercises where staff, you know, are taking this program, going through Skill Builder can, you know, put in keywords. And then on the right, you're seeing want to learn more. Uh, and I want to just call out very specifically Ohio Valley Brain Injury Prevention uh, 
Rehab Center for their fine work in this area. I mentioned them earlier. They have some excellent clips, positive negative teaching example clips that we link to in Skill Builder because they're so well done and they really complement the work that we've been, uh, that we've created with this program. So now let's move on to module five, uh, uh, supporting the use of memory tools. So let's take a look at some sample content there. Skill on the left side, how on the right. So skill one, personalized memory tools. How can you do that? Skill two, practice with the memory tools with the person. And then below that, uh, skill two is adjust the memory tools. It would, you can't, I couldn't get it all in one screenshot. So let's take a look at, uh, uh, first of all, Melissa, a family member, speaking to this topic. Because of his challenges with memory and project management, he really needs to have like a short punctuated list of his activities for the day or his to-do list, like we all do, but he really needs it more to, to function. So we've changed from, we've tried various things. Currently, we use kind of a dry erase board list and some version on an electronic, like his phone, on an app on his phone. Right. And you see in Melissa's, uh, discussion of this topic, this adjusting piece, but the fact is we're still working with memory tools and we're adjusting along the way. So let's take a look at a skills video series now uh, in which we look at more the issue of practice and the importance of practice. So let's take a look at this first clip. I think you have a doctor's appointment later this week. Oh, really? I don't remember. Yeah, I have uh, Friday at 10 a.m. leave by 9.30. Do you wanna meet with me Thursday to get ready? Sure, I guess. Okay, I have 1 or 3 p.m. What works for you? Uh, 3, I guess. Great. I'll see you Thursday. Yep. All right, and we'll contrast it, that sample with this one. So I think you have a doctor's appointment later this week. Oh, really? Uh, I don't remember. Well, I wonder if it's in your calendar. Oh, wait, yeah, uh, Friday doctor's appointment at 10 a.m., leave by 9.30 a.m. That's what I have here. Uh, do you want to meet Thursday to get ready? Uh, I guess. Okay. I have 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. What works best for you? Uh, 3. Great. You might want to put that in your calendar. Yeah, with an alert. <laughs> Anything for you. So, um, Thursday, dog prep, um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot your name. Heather. Uh, Heather. Sounds good. So how will you remember what's going on later this week? Uh, my notes, um, uh, Thursday, uh, three o'clock with you, Heather, and then Friday, dog appointment at 10 a.m., uh, leave by 9.30 a.m. Perfect. I'll see you Thursday at three. Great. Okay. Again, very clear differences between these two clips. The first one where the staff is um, really controlling the flow of the information and where it's being documented. Uh, and whereas in the second clip, she's supporting the, the client with the brain injury and using his own system for calendaring, note keeping and so forth with different types of cues to help them remember to look for the information. And the other layer I would like to call out here is that this particular uh, contrast also reinforces the need to help prepare for healthcare appointments. So that was module seven, and you're seeing the memory tools piece integrated into that space. Okay, um, participating in personally meaningful activities. So some sample content here. Why is this important? Why tops, types of activities can I support? And let's listen in on some um, um, Brian on his perspective with this. One of my greatest strengths, I think, in my life now uh, is probably my ability to act on stage uh, on, in the improv realm. I used to be a actor in tons and tons and tons of shows 
So now that I'm able to do theater again, only in the improv realm, it is so cool to be able to be a part of that and just be a, a presence on the stage again. It, it, it just means the world to me. All right. Let's hear from Faith, another survivor. And the, the ultimate goal at that particular time was that of driving. I've got my driver's license back. Oh, look, the sun is starting to shine. I've got my motorcycle to ride. Oh, I can't ride my motorcycle because I don't have the endorsement. Well, I was on my third time, and after three times, you're out uh, for a, yet another year because I failed the first two times to get my endorsement. So that's part of the goals. That's a part of the goals is having something to work for. Um, these are wonderful examples here. Uh, theater in one case with Brian, with driving um, for Faith, but just like we've been um, sort of underlying a lot of what's been talked about here, it's going to be so individual, so person-centered as to what that would look like. Um, it could be as simple as going out and getting a hummingbird feeder and having a routine around watching, feeding, and learning about hummingbirds. Um, you know, some people are into more quiet activities, maybe not the theater, but maybe writing. It's, there's just so much there, but the core skill is to look for and support an individual as they move through this part of life. Um, so important to talk about self-care for staff. This is important work. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot involved. And uh, so let's, let's take a look here about staff thinking about your feelings, the skill of identifying your feelings and what stress feels like on the job and how to work with that. Um, a second skill, the triggers, what triggers stress for you in this context of, of serving people with brain injuries. Let's go back to Melissa, a family member, and hear from her. You should take care of yourself because ultimately, that puts you in the best spot to be a better caregiver. And also you deserve that too. You deserve good care. It's a short, but very, very sweet and very profound statement that caregivers deserve this time to take care of themselves, whether you're a family member or your staff, it's the same basic things. Um, and then let's hear from Jill again. Working in this field, uh, Self-care is really important. Um, it's important to uh, know your boundaries. Um, in the moments that I've become uh, maybe agitated, upset, I've had to um, walk away from the situation, take a deep breath. Uh, walking around the block has been a big one for me just to clear my brain. Um, and then return, return to the potential stimulus, uh, but know that it doesn't end there. Once, you know, once you've walked away, you need to remember to return to the situation and um, attempt to, to think about it in a new perspective, keep an open mind, um, and try to understand, understanding, uh, where behaviors are coming from is really important. All right. Um, and there with that, that's the last of our clips. What a lovely integration of the self-care piece intermingling with the behavioral support piece. She says it so well. Let's take a look at uh, this other crucial piece of Skill Builder, the online skills journal. And the purpose of including an online skills journal as part of the program is to help promote staff self-reflection and the practical application of the knowledge and skills taught to their daily uh, work context. And there is research to support this approach in the use of what, uh, a, a more technical term, self-delivered feedback to promote skill development. Um, Pinkelman and Horner's paper on this, and Sarah Pinkelman was a consultant on this project. Here's a, a screenshot of what the skills journal looks like. So this comes from module six, support, support cognition. You're given the exact skills that are taught in the program and can click on the ones you feel like you wanna work on and then type in a very brief plan for trying out the skills. 
And then later on, there's a, an opportunity to journal a little bit and reflect on how it's going. So let me read you this one entry from staff that was in our uh, product evaluation study. One thing I have noticed that works much better is when I make sure I give my clients cues in helping them remember things instead of making them guess what I'm trying to think or have them remember what I am already remembering. Why do I play the guessing game with anyone? It is so non-productive and degrading. Conversations go much better when I do this. And to me, that was such a profound uh, reflection because what this individual had done um, is taken in different skills that were taught in the program, but there's also some guidances. And one of them, it's not a skill per se, but it's a, it's a here, heads up, try to avoid this. And that is avoiding uh, questions with the intention to quiz or test. Uh, the person. If that is the intention, and then it can be very hard. <laughs> but it, but there is a role for questions like that if the intention is just to support and like, how are you going to remember to uh, look for that information? For example, when this pair in one of the skills videos, she said, how are you going to remember to your doctor's appointment? So that wasn't really a quiz. It was more of sort of a question prompt to, to, to use his tool to help with that. It's a different, it's a different feeling. Okay, let's take a, a, set, a, a look at a different entry, different participant. More break time and shorter groups resulted in better participation and conversations during activities. I also took more time to sit down one-on-one -on -one and get to know them, talk about their interests, how life is going. This gave me better insight on how their life works and what gives them meaning. And so what's lovely about this quote is that Again, there's integration of skills like uh, we have a break the task down skill. So in this case, what the staff did is broke down the task of, of or break, break down the groups, that is, in terms of numbers. So smaller groups, more breaks, uh, which just gave people the space to process information and enjoy themselves. But then there's this get to know the person aspect uh, in her quote as well. Okay, we're heading down the home stretch here with this webinar. Hope you're all doing okay. Let's take a look at our product evaluation study in which we evaluated Skill Builder in a non-experimental pre-post follow-up evaluation. So we had no comparison or control group with this. We really just wanted to get the program out and get it systematically evaluated and get feedback. So our measures uh, uh, were created uh, for, uh, based on the Skill Builder program. We looked at basic knowledge, the ability to apply the knowledge, knowledge application, self-efficacy in, in one's ability to apply knowledge, frequency of skill use by self-report, and satisfaction with the program only, uh, satisfaction with the program given only once after they finish the training. So the steps were we after consenting the participants they were pretest they were given the pretest with this um, mix of measures then went through the training it's a tunnel through program uh, maybe some of you have uh, registered for skill builder and you'll note you can't hop around in it you have to kind of go from module one through module 14 and that was very intentional as well because the modules build on one another and integrate past skills so it makes for a better package um, and then after the training, participants were administered the post-test with a 60-day follow-up after post-test. That gives you a little bit of the demographics of our participant sample. Um, some more information about years of experience, which is a nice range from one year or less to 16 or more and everything in between. Mostly direct care staff participated with some other uh, provider groups, including program directors, social workers, resource navigators, and so forth. And um, settings were primarily supported living day programs and some medical rehab settings um, with a, a fairly good geographic spread and where these places were located. Here are some examples of the questions the, that the measure included. So a, no, a typical knowledge question would look like this. Um, damage to the front of the brain primarily affects, and then there's a multiple choice options for response. Then knowledge application, in this case, John Jack's personal goal is to prepare his own multi-ingredient dinners, but gets lost in the task. How can you help him? Multiple choice uh, options. And then self-efficacy, how confident am I that I could handle a situation like that? So our results. Um, First of all, this group of participants came in at, with very high levels of knowledge and knowledge application and self-efficacy at pretest. So there wasn't a, oh, there wasn't a lot of room to grow. <laughs> 
So in a way, it was kind of cool, right? But it, and yet, despite those high levels, we still saw significant improvements in knowledge application, which is great because we're really focusing on the skills aspect. And then we also saw gains in knowledge and self-efficacy, but they weren't significant. And by self-report, selected skills were used more frequently from post-test to follow-up, and the vast majority of the participants indicated they would recommend the program to others. In terms of most versus least like features, you can kind of see the breakdown of, uh, of how, what participants thought of the different sections of the program. Um, clearly like the videos, uh, maybe less so the interactives, including the skill journal. And in terms of program satisfaction, I thought the program was easy to use. So this was more the technical aspect of using Skill Builder and the majority of the participants agreed. Um, and then how useful was it? Um, again, pretty high ratings there. Um, but understandably, some folks did not find it useful. And that often was in the case of an individual who had lots of experience with, with serving this population. Um, so that was just fine. So here are just uh, a few of the many comments that came in with the product evaluation that it was suggested, uh, and this is, echoes a theme from several participants, that it's a training for someone brand new to brain injury, which was, in, which was by design from the get-go, and for paraprofessionals with more experience, it's a nice refresher course. And then another participant uh, indicated that many of the strategies could be used with other disabilities. Now, this isn't something we set out to do, but we were really happy to see that comment that there really isn't this kind of training for home health care workers. Um, they are trained on meds and procedures, but not the how-to aspect. So finally, how can you get to the program? What's that like? Um, uh, the top uh, web address is, is the landing page off our Siebert website where you can get a nice overview of the program. There's a nice introductory video that goes with it, and then you can register from there. That same introductory video is available on YouTube, and then um, the videos in the program, all of the personal narrative videos, we shot a whole lot more video footage than we were able to include in the program, so you can get access to all those videos as well as the ones in the program, and the skills videos as well. Okay, current status. Um, we made Skill Builder available at no cost uh, to the public starting in September of 2019. And since then, we've had, um, I think we're up to 380 self registrants, and uh, over 130 have completed the entire 14 module program. Uh, and for those who complete the program, we ask that they fill out a little, an, another program evaluation survey just we, so we can see who's using the program, how they're feeling about it, do they have any suggestions. And the roles are just as varied as, as you can imagine. Um, direct care staff for sure are participating, but so are social workers, resource coordinators, program directors who might want to screen the program to see if they want to be able to use it in their settings. Excuse me, job coaches. We've had some registered nurses, some family members. Um, uh, some have said it's been a required OT and speech path students have said it's been required of, uh, for their graduate training to go through this. So. It's been great, just really exciting to see the diverse um, uses of Skill Builder and the context as well, um, supported living communities, day programs, again, that was by design. And we actually have at least one state that now has it as approved training option for, for individuals served on their TBI waiver program. Um, and satisfaction with the program continues to be high, but we do get suggestions for tweaks and changes and we welcome that. You can earn professional development certificate by completing all the modules and our two part quiz with 80% accuracy uh, cumulatively and our program survey. And if you'd like more information, feel free to reach out to me or to Jody Slocum, who was the project coordinator. Here's some selected references and uh, just a huge, huge gratitude to um, those who worked on this cast of thousands <laughs> project starting with our advisory board members, an amazing, dedicated group, the wonderful group of people I get to work with at Siebert, um, our videography photography teams, um, and who put together the personal narrative videos uh, and, uh, and also our skills videos, and then finally the project officer from Nidler, and then our, our subject matter experts. All right, I am at the end of the slideshow. 
And I'm going to check the time here. We have about six minutes for questions and wrap up. So I'm going to turn it back over to Amanda. And okay. Well, thank you, Lori. That was really fantastic. And we've had a lot of um, chats and questions um, as we've been going along. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first questions, I'm going to grab them in a couple different places. I'm going to grab my little chat box over here that's hiding. <laughs> Um, so Daniel Bircher would like to know if you plan on making a program to educate family or care providers about TBI. Uh, it's a great question. Um, if, it, if it, you're thinking about a program along these lines, um, we do have at Seabird a family member oriented program. Um, I don't have the title of it quite front of mind right now, but if you go to our website and look at completed programs on the family support for brain injury, you please take a look at that because that might be um, in, in the wheelhouse you're looking for. Okay, I think that one might be called FAMWEB, but I'll, I'll double check that and we can- Okay, thank you. I worked on it and now I can't remember what it is. <laughs> We've done a few projects since then. Uh, uh, and, and please know uh, the, the other resources I mentioned earlier, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Amanda, uh, Brainline, you know, it's a different format. Of course, it's not, a, it's not a complete packaged program, but they have so much that they've offered for family members. As a clinician, I often link up to Brainline and Model Systems Translation Center materials as well, because they just really dial in very tightly on some important issues. So I just wanted to re reiterate that. Okay, um, so a couple more questions. Um, looks like Michael Mazzani, I think maybe you answered this actually right as he was writing this. He said, have providers taken advantage of this free resource? And I, I would think probably based on what you were saying earlier, there's lots of people who are taking advantage of this so far. Absolutely, this is not in research mode anymore. It's out there, it's your taxpayers dollars out there to be shared in, and just to, but just to kind of have in back of mind that it, it was geared you know, by design for staff. But like I said, we were, we're finding out that lots of people are, are, are looking at it. And so go for it. Um, and J.D. Kemp wants to know which state uses it for their TPA training program. Um, you know, I have not um, gotten their permission to share that. So I should have probably have done that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to send us your email address, I would be happy to connect you with that state. Um, I, I just okay. want to respect them, yeah. Um, and I should have that your email address, so if that is interesting to you, please um, send me a chat or let me know. I'm happy to do that. I think all of you have my email as well, which is um, presa at cbirt.org. Um, uh, let's see, we have a few more in here. Mm -hmm. um, Lenora Ingram is asking if the training includes a module on self-care and the service provider. Yes, the self-care for staff, I, if I'm understanding your question mm -hmm. correctly, would be that, um, would be in that, uh, targeting that area. Okay. Yeah. Sandy Pendergraft says, you said we can view additional videos on the Siebert site. Are these videos available for use with presentations developed by other organizations? Yes, the, 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 um, they're actually on YouTube. So the links I put in there for you, they'll take you to our Seabert. Oh, that's probably what you meant. I'm sorry. The Seabert site on YouTube. Kind of get all the terms interchanged. But absolutely, they are de-identified. Uh, but it's pretty clear who is a family member, survivor, staff person. And um, they, those interviewees have been given us their permission to please share this information. I'm, I couldn't be more grateful to the people who were interviewed, uh, some of whom are on this call today. And I'm, I just want you to know that. So please, yes, I'm speaking on behalf of those individuals. Use the videos however you would like. Um, okay, and the, I can answer this next one. Tracy Pavlas was wanting to know if we'll be sending something so we can access the links he provided, and that would be in order to disseminate the resources to any other of our team. So, um, Tracy, I, 
I been hearing kind of hit and miss that some people got the slides and some didn't before this presentation. I suspect some of them went to spam folders. Um, so yes, we will be resending these slides out. So please do look for them. I'll be sending it out later this afternoon or early evening um, once we get all of this turned over into our next YouTube video because this was recorded um, and is available for people to get that. So that will be coming. Um, and the next one is for you, Lori. Melissa Wisnant would like to know if there's a time limit on how long this training will be available to the public. Nope. As long as we can keep our web developer happy and <laughs> <laughs> we will keep it up to the public. That's our, that's our mission at Seabird, um, to, to make these tools available. Um, you know, uh, so we see no, there's no uh, future cutoff point at this point, but I, I can't say that the way down the road that it may not change because sometimes technology changes and web platforms change, but the content will remain the same. We do have the copyright on the content so we can move it around and do what we need to do. But um, yeah, so thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I know we are out of time. Uh, I so appreciate all of your, your questions. Um, and I see some of you have added in that you would like to connect. And so I will uh, make sure I keep a copy of this chat to reach out to you guys. Sure. Um, so that if you do have follow-up questions, we will do our best to connect with you. Um, our website, if you do want to come look at our stuff, is um, www.cbirt.org. Um, and we uh, will be sending out information following this. Feel free to connect or email me or Lori. Our information is there and you can see Lori's email is up on the screen. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording now.